Okay, everyone. So I'm Kyle Davis from the. I was a distinguished architect at CDW. I've just changed roles in January from a practice lead role. So I now run a team of individuals that focus on um, strategy definition and multi stream complex uh, projects over various countries of the world. Um, disclaimer that Jack and the guys have already said still applies to me. So some of the things that I say are definitely not what my employer would like me to say, and definitely not what maybe VMware or Citrix might want me to say as well. Um, I am a VMware V expert, a Citrix CTA, and a few of the other invitation only accreditations from those vendors. Um, I should be getting renewed on most of those, but I can't formally announce all that stuff yet. I have a blog, so feel free to come and read some of the content that I'm writing on there. There's a YouTube channel which is starting in the next month, so there's going to be content on there on a weekly basis moving forward, covering various components within Azure, within the WVD, Citrix, VMware, Frame, from Nutanix, there's going to be lots of various things as well as consumer grade things as well, so I've just built my home office at home and I couldn't get internet connections, I've used Ubiquiti's nano beam technology to beam my internet connection from my house to my outbuilding in the garden kind of scenario rather than dig up the garden. So kind of maybe not what you use in a business scenario, but it's quite useful for anyone that wants to try and put it in the, <coughs> the bottom end of their garden without digging it up, right? Um, follow me on Twitter, all that usual stuff. I've got 14, 15 years of experience in the industry, mm -hmm. roughly about, oh, probably, just over half of that in the channel, working for the <coughs> so I've worked at um, various places like ANS for a very short amount of time, CTUS, Block, Intrinsic, and now I'm at CDW, um, focusing my time and effort there, trying to, trying to build a career for myself. Um, I kind of broke the agenda down into two parts, and feel free to ask questions at any time, um, and we probably will jump around a bit as well. The first part is more about where is the market of workplace transformation in general, not just WVD and where does it fit and the use cases ultimately and what is WVD and what does it mean to you as individuals. And then part two going into some of that, how we're going to manage it, what is the current state of play today, is it something you could promote internally for your business or for one of your customers to take forward and there's pros and cons to it, right? And we're going to see a few videos of how it performs over a, over a, a WAN connection and things like that so you can get a feel for whether these things are ready for general use and consumption. So part one, CambridgeDictionary.com, because the dictionary doesn't give you a, 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 a thing like that generally. It says that a, a, a place of work or a workplace where you go and do something is the same building you go to every day. And we know that's kind of changed over the last few years. So take this building as a prime example, right? It's a community space where people sign up to a membership and we come and work together for different organizations, share ideas, all that kind of stuff. And the idea is now is that it's gone from this very Americanized cubicle model. I know I never worked in a world like that personally. I don't know if anyone else in the room did, but then it kind of moved to more like a, a Shoreditch-esque kind of feel, open plan, making everyone be able to see each other, managers maybe not having offices anymore and being in the office space with the workers that are working for them, all that kind of stuff. And as that kind of occurred, people started to look at like thin clients and, and some kind of like VDI opportunity or even just like the old NetFrame XP and, and, and presentation, so four days from a Citrix perspective, even just native RDS on 2003 server and things like that. And they started to use those to kind of patch out these hot desk in areas and, and provide a way of getting more utilization out of the small footprint they might have in, in an office space ultimately. Then people started working from home more, and then you've got people working in coffee shops, and then you've got people like me when my son was born working in the hospital where he was in intensive care. Because I didn't want to use my paternity to sit in a hospital and stare at him in a little little box ultimately, when I could actually be still doing my work, there's not a lot I could do at that moment in time to help in no shape or form. So fortunately my employee allowed me to work remotely via Citrix group that I work for, and then use my paternity when it was right to come out of the hospital and, and do that. More time with the family worked out quite well, and I think a lot of employers now are moving towards that model of allowing flexibility and agility for their workforce. If they're not, is it someone, something someone takes into account when looking at a job? Possibly. But do you know whether that they're actually going to offer you that from day one, you probably don't find out until you're three to six months into the role anyway. Main vendors ultimately in this kind of place that we talk about is Citrix, VR and Microsoft. Microsoft being the core against all of them, right, because we can't deliver any of these services in most traditional workplaces without Microsoft being part of the core fundamental technology. And all of them talk about anywhere, anytime, any device. Every single one of them. The problem is for me is that in most organizations I go and speak to, it's not about the any device bit. 
generally speaking, right? So people like to bring your own device to your phone, maybe, and every now and again there's, a, there's an organisation that I go and see that are like, yeah, we definitely want to do BYOD for out abroad and let people have whatever they want. It's a very, very small number of customers I see doing that. It's more based on this corporately owned business only model, right? A laptop or a PC or whatever is being given to you by your employer that's going to be in tune, managed potentially, and delivered to you on, on demand as soon as you start your day and patched by IT and all that kind of stuff. It's generally not the kind of corporately owned personally enabled where you can install games on it and all that kind of stuff. So it's still, we're still very much giving a service to a user like we were doing five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. Really, just we've got better ways of managing it and better ways of delivering the service and a little bit of personalization <coughs> without risk and security. Probably like the kind of past to present slash future kind of scenario. Um, most people generally used to have a phone and a laptop or a phone and a desk with a PC on it, whatever it might be. And now it's people have got a watch, a phone, a tablet, a laptop, and maybe a desk machine they log on to every now and again, or a thing client, and all these things. And now you have to manage all those, all those components in the workplace. Application sprawl getting more and more out of control. I remember going to an organization saying, yeah, all of our applications will be web-driven in the next five years. Uh, visit the same organization 10 years later, and they're still nowhere near doing that kind of stuff, right? They've still got legacy Windows applications. I think there's a good slide that was put out by, um, I think it was Ruben Sprite um, from Nutanix, where it's basically like the last thing on the planet that will survive will be cockroaches and Windows legacy applications. <laughs> They're the only two things that will exist, right? And we're never going to get away from them, so we need a way of delivering those services without breaking our security model and our delivery mechanisms and potentially the device choice that we want to give users. I go for all them, but ultimately, there's a lot more to manage, a lot more option, a lot more flexibility. That basically means there's more for us to worry about. More importantly, at the bottom, everything is a service now. Everything, want, every vendor you speak to, every partner you speak to, everything's being delivered as a service on a subscription model per month, per year, whatever it might be. It's, it's the way that everyone's moving to, whether we kind of like it or not, to a degree. Um, and it still might not be the right fit for you, but unfortunately, everyone's getting pushed down that kind of, that kind of route. So, some of these slides, if anyone's been on a WVD masterclass, has anybody been on one of those? Anybody? Just anybody? No, just me. Okay, I'm Jack. Um, they're stolen from Microsoft, right? I'm not going to lie, I haven't written all this deck on my own because it's pointless reinventing the wheel. But what you'll see I have done is crossed out some of the marketing stuff that Microsoft have put on there um, because it isn't true. Um, so, what is WVD? My opinion here is that it's kind of like a marketing strategy. A lot of the concepts that Microsoft are talking about is things that we've been able to do for the last 10, 15 years. But when Microsoft puts marketing behind something, it just starts stirring it up again. Everyone goes, oh, that sounds like a fantastic idea. I've never seen that before. I've been doing it for 10 years or more. But now it's kick-started everyone interested to look at doing different things with the way they deliver their services to their own users. And that kind of idea of beating the drum and then people following and doing as Microsoft say generally happens at some point. So, Microsoft WVD is not an innovation by itself, right? It is Windows 10 delivered as a service from Azure. We can deliver Windows 10 VDI from Azure without WVD. The thing here, though, is it's the multi-user aspect of Windows 10 that has made it different. Because we've not been able to do that before, and today, you can't do it anywhere else but in Azure. So that's the, that's the main selling, that's the innovation. It's not doing VEI or virtual workspace or something like that, that's the innovation piece. And Microsoft have kind of come out with these kind of security regulation, elastic workforce, specific employees, specialized workloads. Reading between the lines, what it basically means is WVD is not for general purpose. It's not for delivering VDI to every user in your organization. It's not that, it's for a specific use case maybe for a specific application or, uh, or whatever it might be, it's not for everybody. It's not like the year of the VDI, right, that everyone keeps talking about, it's never ever going to come. It's just never going to come. So what is it? It is the best. Okay. No, it's not. <laughs> right? It is an option. It's not necessarily the best. And define the best isn't probably the thing that we should try and focus on a little bit. But ultimately, it's delivering a Windows 10 virtual desktop, whether it's multi-user or not, back to those users securely with optimizations, thanks to FSLogix, for Office 365, Teams, and the various other products from the Microsoft portfolio. The main thing for me, though, is 
you can deliver all of that today without WVD again. We've all, FS Logics is available to everyone before WVD came out, and people are already using it. It's just now available pretty freely as part of the licensing model that they give you. And the other thing you'll notice says is scale in minutes. It 100% doesn't scale in minutes. Anything doing in the Azure portal takes at least 20, 30 seconds for it to even realize you've clicked the button sometimes. But then also you've got to realize is that, has anyone tried to deploy the BVD? Okay. Who loves PowerShell? Okay, like two or three people ish. Okay. It's very PowerShell heavy. You need to get all the SPNs in place. You know, basically, it's like a virtual desktop by code. That is the way it's done today. There's no manage there is a management GUI, but it's a Git pub repository built by a community. It's not one that initially Microsoft has given out to the marketplace yet. In the near future, there will be a WVD blade in the Azure portal where you'll be able to manage these things, but it's not available yet. Everything's done by code. PowerShell, we'll make a change, PowerShell, we'll do this, PowerShell, we'll monitoring, there is no monitoring. All those kind of things start to unpick the the, the infancy of WVD and why you may not promote it today as its current infancy program. That's the main piece though, multi-session. But we could do multi-session with RDS, with 2016 server 2019, and skin it to look like Windows 10. And the sizing for a 2016 or 2019 server multi-user is the same sizing we would use for a Windows 10 multi-user session. So actually, the only difference being is Edge, but now Edge is available on everything, so it doesn't matter, and the App Store. Other than that, everything else was already available on RDS. Optimizations, all of that was delivered by FS Logics, right? <coughs> Containerization of the profile, the Office 365 containers capturing OST files for Exchange Online, all those kind of components, because if anyone's tried to run Exchange Online in online mode without Outlook, we'll know it's quite slow, quite clunky, it takes to download the emails, it's generally between a UK resource and an Exchange Online tenant, is about 250 milliseconds of latency. Putting cache mode on in VDI in the past was a big no-no, especially if it was non-persistent with Citrix or VMware because you had nowhere to store that OST that would follow them without corrupting it over time. With FS Logics, you can containerize that and basically read it on demand and write it on demand. That then is now the supported model from Microsoft for delivering any Office 365 deployment and profiles for WVD. So about migrating desktops and apps to Azure. Who saw the marketing campaign from Microsoft that said, move your Windows 7 VMs to, well, Windows 7 desktops to Azure and we'll give you extended support for free? Yeah, yeah. Does anyone look at how much it costs to do extended maintenance on Windows 7 versus running a VM in Azure for a month? Yeah. So it's cheaper just to pay extended maintenance, actually, than it would have been to move those workloads in Azure. Especially if you were going to leave them on 24 7. The idea here, though, is that you can move these workloads now into WVD. So WVD is not just Windows 10. WVD provides 2016 and 2019 server app publishing capability via the WVD portfolio. So it's not just desktop OS, Windows 10. Again, I mentioned the point scale in minutes. It's not. It's really not. I, I really urge anybody to go out there, other than Jack, to go and deploy it in less than an hour. Because it, it does take a bit of time. And getting the SPNs right, and getting things to communicate with your AD, and then your on-prem, well, your hybrid domain controllers, and all that kind of stuff. It takes time, doesn't work the first time. You get an error, you have to then blitz the environment because you can't find out where it's made the changes and where it hasn't, and you have to start again. And you go in this like, ever-changing loop. So when it first came into like a beta preview for us all to play with, there's a few of us have started to, to try and deploy it. And I wouldn't say I'm the most uneducated person in the world on workspace, but even I struggled to get to a point where I could get it working and be happy with it. And we had guys from Microsoft, like Jim Moyle, who's a guy that works for FS Logics, and I was a global black belt for Microsoft on WVD. Initially, he was like, this is just ridiculous. The amount of time and effort you have to put into this to get it to work is going to make everyone walk away from it and go elsewhere. Yeah, I didn't get away from the first time. Which is why the partner ecosystem is extremely key at this moment in time. Because if you want to do that very quickly, there are vendors out there with a quantity later that can streamline that process for you, give you the things that are missing in the current instance product. 
And it could be that you could do a very short-term subscription to fix that gap until Microsoft bring out their version of it, and then you can get rid of that piece of software and go native. Maybe. Additional benefits, I kind of mentioned most of them, but the idea is, is that you can move your Windows Server right those things for sure, you can do other virtual desktops, virtual applications, all that kind of stuff. Again, it's, it's not, nothing groundbreaking, nothing, nothing's changing. The one thing I want to note is that just because you can put it in Azure doesn't mean you should. So if you think about our data center services, so who's running their, their data center workloads for their business today in Azure? In Azure? Other than you. Nobody? No, oh, that's a surprise. Um, the, most organizations are hybrid, right? So you're going to have some services in Azure, some services on premise. With WVD today, it's an Azure only option, right? So what happens when you want to deliver a virtual desktop to an on premise bunch of people? Today, in the GA, you can't. So you then got disparate platforms. You end up with a Citrix environment, a VMware environment, or just a native RDS environment on prem, and then WVD in the cloud, different management platforms, different operational structures, all that kind of thing. It gets very, very messy very, very quickly. So the high-level architecture, so it's that shared ownership model with everything with Azure. Microsoft provides you the service, which is the web access, the brokering services, the licensing, all that kind of component. As well as the hosting and the bits at the bottom, which you can't see, it says WVD. <coughs> so and then the bit in the middle is the bit that you look after, or a partner looks after, or your MSP. That is ultimately the image, or your session host, or your Windows 10 VMs that people log on to. The bit where actually all the work is. So keeping that up to date, keeping it secure, making sure the apps are in there and they work, the profile elements, all that kind of element is your responsibility, not Microsoft. They're just providing you a broker service into the platform. Who's eligible for WVD? Anybody that has that licensing on screen, which is pretty much anyone that has a Microsoft product almost, from an Office 365 perspective, or M365 perspective, through to Windows 10 VDA licensing, which anyone that's doing VDI today will already have a Windows 10 VDA license more than one. And if we marry that back to um, FS Logic for points in a moment, it's the same licensing. So you can get on premise FS Logics with the current licensing we've got as well. They we announced recently RDS CALs, RDS CALs, they provide you with access into WBD as well. So it's not just native M365, F1, E3, and all that kind of stuff. So FS Logics was kind of an actually made in 2018, which allowed them to plug a gap in the portfolio of delivering their core productivity suite in a way that actually worked for business. And that was around containerization, that was around the way that we catch the profiles, it was around masking of applications from a licensing compliance perspective. It was also for any sysadmins in the room, think about we build a, a VM and we shove all of our, our tools on there with Java, we have like 20 <coughs> versions of Java on there and then one updates and they're all broke. So Java redirection is a part of the product that solves that, where we can have multiple versions of Java and we map a specific Java runtime to a specific executable or website to make sure it doesn't try and reference one that it shouldn't be referencing. And you get kind of a consistent runtime within Java and the environment rather than a mix match that generally doesn't work. <coughs> Mentioned, that's what gives you access to FS Logics. Basically, any license from Microsoft gives you FS Logics. It's the easiest way of thinking about it. Current constraints. So, VDI or a virtual workspace in general is an online only mechanism, right? So, if you don't have an internet connection, you can't use it. So if you've got offline workers or a connection to the internet connection in your office breaks, whatever it might be, you need a business continuity plan, you need to be able to function still, you need to factor that into any designs that you put forward, right? Which is why VDI, as a general purpose approach, hasn't taken off as well as everyone wanted to. Because any kind of blip in your network generally meant you couldn't function at all as a business. At least if you had a PC on your desk or a laptop, you could still maybe compose a few emails or open Word and create a document or tether to your phone and get internet access and do whatever there if you needed to. But on a VDI or, or virtual workspace world, you don't have that, that, that functionality. The management challenges I mentioned before, adding users, increasing tools, the simple tasks that people have been doing that manages the Citrix VMware environment. So does anyone do anything with Citrix VMware Horizon today? 
bits. Okay. So most of the simple tasks like image management, non-persistent images, you create a gold image, you deploy it out to 100 machines, then every time they reboot, it'll go back to the gold image state. That's a very nice and easy process within VMware Horizon, Frame, Cloud Spot, uh, sorry, WorkSpot, Cloud Jumper, Connectivity, all those kind of things. They all provide a single image, a single management capability, and an image management process, which next, 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 finish scenario, right? You can't really get it wrong. In WVD world, there's a lot of manual tasks you have to make. So, for example, creating a, a Windows 10 based image with applications on there, you've got to remember to generalize it and make sure that it's ready to be imported and you clear out the right registry keys and all that kind of stuff. Whereas in those other products, they've built in ways of doing that for you and automating it. It's not as easy to deploy, as I mentioned earlier, um, especially if you want to do multi region as well. So if anyone has multiple regions in Azure where you're going to be going, say, into a UK region, then you're going to go into a Europe region, then into an American region, that in this current deployment would be completely separate management planes, completely separate configurations, they don't talk to each other, you end up with managing multiples of environments. And if you have a large customer, for example, that does that, it doesn't scale. You end up managing far too much stuff and there's never a consistent config anywhere. Unless you do it through code and you just keep redeploying things via code. On code, PowerShell, PowerShell, and more PowerShell, that is the fundamentals of WD today. If you can't proficiently write PowerShell scripts, and WVD is 100% not the answer for you today. Whereas if you look at the likes of VMware and Citrix, they have all that built into a nice GUI, there's all that stuff. In. All it's doing is initiating a PowerShell command in the back end, but it does all that stuff for you on demand. You don't have to think about it. Optimizations is a key one for a constraint. And the key thing on this one for me is that Microsoft Teams, audio-visual, is not supported on WVD natively, as an example. It is only supported with Citrix today as an offload. When we think about audio-visual offloading to, to an endpoint, um, and then their own native product doesn't do it. And why doesn't it do it? Because they use RDP and remote effects. We think about the way that, that think like an electrical cable, and RDP is just one big fat cable, there's no strands inside it. Whereas if you think around a, a Citrix or a VMware Horizon perspective, you open that cable, you've got like a the green cable, the red cable, the yellow cable, all that kind of stuff, and that's what you get with Citrix world. Each one of those cables is a different function of periphery pass-through, printer pass-through, optimization of file transfer and compression. All those can be done in the background without you even knowing about it, which we don't have in WVD today. Which is another reason why you may want to look at one of those as an overlay onto the problem. Limited thin client support. So if you've got Windows 10 IoT thin clients, you're fine. If you've got a Linux thin client estate, the only vendor today, as of this week, or last week, is iGel. And if you look at the decks from Ignite, it showed iGel and Samsung. That's it. So what about Dell, what about HP, what about all the main thing, Tenzer, and all these other guys in the market? They're not on the roadmap right now. They're doing stuff in the background, but they're not validating the supported thing clients by Microsoft yet. When we think about our customer bases, they already have these devices on desk, so when you go to them and say, let's move some of your users to WVD, but we've got to replace all the endpoints as well. Doesn't really good out there, all right. Protocol, kind of mentioned before, um, we'll come on to protocols a bit more a bit later on. Monitoring, there is no monitoring in the product. How do you know whether the environment is performing or not? You have access to the Azure <coughs> dashboards that show you CPU memory and disk. It doesn't tell you who's using that. It doesn't tell you what the performance actually is for that user and what productivity impact they're having, as an example. It gives you none of that information. It's just standard infrastructure monitoring. So that, that needs to change as well. There's no help desk tool either. So you can't remote shadow someone. You can do remote windows remote assistance, but it's not built into the platform. So you think about the usual kind of things we're used to, going to a portal, finding out what apps they're running, what CPU they've got, what disk and memory, what client they're connecting from, the local IP address, the firmware versions. Every other vendor that delivers a virtual workspace today gives you that kind of help. Right? So I haven't given you one yet. There is a community kit thing you can download and have a look at, but again, it's, it's not a magic problem yet. And then periphery pass-through, if we take things back to like, when people used to run RDS natively, one of the biggest challenges with getting optimized periphery pass-through 
and even things where I work with like a, a, an optical organization who do eye tests and things, and they've got the ones that put the awful puff of air into your eye. Um, it basically that, that connects as a serial connection to a serial USB hub into the back of a device, and then they have some software that basically translate that into the application they use to do the, the, the output. The thing is that that on a Linux thing client typically doesn't work. On a Windows thing client means you have to put all the native agents in. But then also to get it working in the virtual desktop, you have to install the agents in there and all the drivers in there as well. So it all speaks the same language. What we found in some very early tests with WVD is some of that legacy <coughs> that some organizations have got, it doesn't pull through. It doesn't work properly. It's like that idea where you start printing something and web things comes out, right? It's that kind of scenario. Um, and then periphery pass through could be used by USB mass storage, right? Plug that in and I copy a file from my USB device into my virtual <coughs> session. With all of the other providers today, because they're using more than RDP, they have an optimized channel for file transfer where it's compressing the data and then decompressing it into the data center. So it's faster. If you just Google Dare to Compare as an example on, on YouTube, you'll see these videos from Citrix and VMware and all these guys just. Forget WBD for a second, well, those guys fighting each other for it, right? WBD can't even do it. So then we get, we get those guys that are there playing in the market space, we can give you optimization on this stuff. And when you're thinking about copying this stuff into Azure, if you've not got Express Group, you're just using VPN Gateway, or you're using an internet breakout, and you're paying the cost of the network connection. So optimizing that traffic, whether it's the protocol or whether it's the compression of the periphery pass through, is quite key. Otherwise, you're going to get spiraling out of control network costs. So I mentioned um, the management UI, it's on GitHub, and this is in the notes of the slide deck, which I'm sure the guys will share, there's the link to go and download that. It is a VM that you have to deploy, and then you basically drop the code onto it, and that gives you a, a management UI. Um, it gives you that functionality there. It's not very intuitive, it doesn't give you any errors if it goes wrong today, it just allows you to do things a bit more simply than trying to do it all in PowerShell yourself. That will speed up a way of deploying an environment, or you could just use the Azure Marketplace and try and do it from there. It wouldn't be the first thing I would say going to use to manage your environment today. It, you're probably better building your own PowerShell scripts and just into repeating those than it is using that today. So, coopetition, which is a, probably a made up word, I'm not too sure. Um, but it's what the vendors are kind of using with Microsoft because anything that promotes Azure consumption, Microsoft loves. Right? Absolutely loves it. Because it's driving their back end, they're doing no sales, really. So the likes of VMware <coughs> and uh, Workspot and Citrix and everyone else that offer their services to, to Azure, might say, yeah, come on board, why not? If we think about a few years back when Remote App got end of life, there was no equivalent, so Citrix released um, Virtual Apps Essential Service or whatever it was at the time to replace it, which was like 20 times the cost of remote app. Um, the, the, the issue being was is that Microsoft removed that and they had no product. What they've seen is an increase of workloads of a specific type of the platform, which in my opinion is why they've built WVD. There's always been a requirement for a, for a poor man Citrix. Right, where people want drug box servers that perform just good enough. Or well, they've got a receptionist kiosk that are happy to do VAR DPO because they have a line connection over an express room for argument's sake. They might be good use cases. Rather than a CAD CAM machine in the corner with GPU requirements probably isn't a good fit today. So why would you put someone like Citrix on top of WVD? The protocol, and you can see the wires that I was talking about. More importantly, they can flick automatically during the session between TCP and UDP to deliver the best user experience that you can get based on the connection you've got access to. And it optimizes that based on the connection without IT or the user doing anything if it's configured properly. All of those little thin wires in the middle, they are all the compression layers and the, the, the value adds you get from using an enterprise grade overlay like Citrix or VMware. The hybrid scenario, you could do it on-prem, you can do it in Azure, you can do it in AWS, you can do it wherever. You could do that with Citrix or VMware. You don't have to worry about 
I can only do WD, BD here, so I can't do it anywhere else. What we do? Well, you've got other options of doing that and mixing and matching, but manually it in the same way. That's not good news, is it? Um, centralised management. So with most of the main providers today, they have a, a evergreen as a service model for their control tier. So think of WVD as a control tier, but Citrix giving you that as an evergreen model. So you don't have to learn how to or pay someone to come and implement Citrix delivery controllers, storefront servers, net scalers. If you've seen the latest CVs on Netscaler, you might not want to put that out there right now. Um, all those kind of elements on there that, that they can deliver as a service evergreen back to you. You don't have to manage it and patch it and upgrade it. They do all that on your behalf. And the only bit that you as a consumer need to worry about is the same as you would do in the Microsoft world. The image, the desktop, the application layer. That's what you need to focus on. And then Citrix take care of everything else for you. Same with VMware with their Horizon Cloud server. Context aware. You can kind of do a bit of context conditional awareness. Um, I haven't tried it, if I'm completely honest, um, around using conditional access policies with the likes of um, Intune and all those kind of things to prevent people accessing WVD if they're not in the right place. I've not tried it. It's been hit and miss in the community. So it doesn't recognise, uh, WVD client doesn't recognise the ones being Intune managed, so your conditional access policy fails. So, yeah, it's been fed back to the product group. Uh, I saw it on the Yammer channel earlier today. Yeah, I think what the guys were saying from what I was seeing was like, if you use the HTML5 client, then it works fine. Yeah. But the native client doesn't. <coughs> uh, larger periphery support, because they've been around doing this for a while. Adaptive transport, I mentioned it fails over to what it needs to do. Um, UC optimizations for Skype, Teams, and Jabber. They actually provide the optimizations for audio and visual uh, content. They also do media offload. So the likes of people watching um, media files on their session in VLC or with a media player or whatever it might be, that will offload to a thin client if you've got the right type of thing <coughs> to take the, 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 the CPU and memory draw from the server to the endpoint. Because actually these thin clients are pretty powerful as well, right? You're paying and a lot of times two, three hundred pounds for a thin client, which is just acting as a kiosk into this environment. And you can offload some of this performance to an endpoint. With WVD, we can't do that today either. I'm fairly sure something's coming on that. Just don't know when, but unfortunately the roadmap website doesn't say anything either. Um, accelerated printing and file transfer I mentioned, so compression on the print and file transfers uh, through the protocol mm -hmm. continues. But then from a printing perspective, you have universal print services, which can be AMO, which you don't have in Microsoft as well. So you can use as your print, I believe, or new services on there. I've not tried it, I don't know whether it works. I don't know whether you've looked at it. Yeah. Uh, I've not looked at your print. I think you, you, you guys have looked at the Intune Managed Print stuff. Mm -hmm. Any good? So I used to be active directory on premise with uh, <coughs> servers and all that kind of stuff. So it's a bit, it's basically uh, a web server in front of it. Print server. Yeah, server. Directory print services. Yeah. <laughs> really? Right. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, however, it does publish it using Intune really well. That's good. Well, it's better than doing PowerShell scripts than that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the main thing, the other thing on there as well as what I see is <coughs> most of the most people have got like a follow me print platform with a paper cut um, engine in the back end. They generally only use one or two <coughs> as well and they actually have capability to, to do that in a secret session anyway, so it's not too much of a problem. But people that don't have that and they want to do periphery passing from home for printers, that's, that's quite key. Why should you get that wing doing the web things and put it out and people complain? And then endpoint support, I mentioned IGEL, the only ones that can provide a Linux thing client for WVD today. Citrix and VMware support over a billion devices. So if a user crop, like, turns up and says, I'm using this today, in mean, that platform, it's like, yeah, okay. If it's on WVD, if it's HTML5 client, then yeah, great, but you don't get all the functionality. The VMware slide is coming in a minute, but it's not very long. Um, there's a reason for that. So I've, got, I've stolen some content from a guy called Lee Jeffries. Um, so he is a CTP for Citrix. Um, so I'm like in the baby program for CTA. Um, I don't have enough time to become a CTP, if I'm honest. Um, and they did some testing of RDP and remote effects versus the ICA protocol on Citrix. Unoptimized, so they've not come and tweaked any policies. It's just out of the box, next, next finish of Citrix. Same with RDP. There's no GPUs in use, so we're not offloading anything anywhere. It's all run on CPU, within Azure, right? And what they found was running on an RDP session with a task worker workload, it was quite peaks and trophies as you can see, but if you look on there, like 0 0.7, 1.3, 1.5 peak megabytes per second, or megabits per second, if you look at the bottom, the average <coughs> is probably about 0 0.7. Right? 
like per user. If we look at an ICA session, it very rarely does above one, really. You have one big peak and it drops down, but the average is about 0.2. So it's a lot less. That's out of the box. No, I'm not even, no optimization, no nothing, no registry hacks, no policy changes, just next bit's finish, and you get a more optimized connection that will fill out. If you think of like a, a knowledge worker scenario, so this is someone watching a YouTube video, is the test. And we can see at the bottom there from an RDP perspective, the big peak where the video starts and plays and it drops off when they stop the video, 20 megabits per second. And then it drops back down to where it should be. We do that from a six perspective, it only ever peaks about 15. But then it offloads natively because the default option is offload when you can. But it drops down quite quickly and then runs away. <coughs> and if we think about it from a, from a network and a tier perspective and paying ingress, egress costs, and all those things potential, even just put over an express route, you can size an express route a lot smaller potentially if people are connecting over a basic connection. Mileage does vary depending on what's running in the sessions, <coughs> but you can kind of see straight away there's some savings to be had in, in those scenarios. If you think of it from a WAN perspective, um, we all know that natively RDP and remote effects, when it gets above 100 milliseconds, is kind of a little bit ropey at times. Um, and it starts to jump around a little bit, the keyboard lag and things. It has got better in the latest releases, so long as you're running an up to date fat client version of uh, the RDP agent. If you're running a SIPS environment, I've got customers running 300 milliseconds of latency, and it's good enough. So they're probably getting the same experience at 300 milliseconds as Microsoft natively is probably 100 milliseconds. So there's conversations I've been having with customers recently where they're putting a, a, a data center move into a public cloud provider and their entire data center, or majority of the data center services are going into this, this public cloud. They're putting their Citrix workloads up there because you put your Citrix workloads closer to your application data because that's the way it performs. And what we found is that they've got some, some US users, and they're going to spin up like a US region just for these very small 20, 30, 40 users. And that wasn't really cost effective. But actually, the latency from the US to the UK was about 185 milliseconds, roughly. That was actually more than performant doing it across the WAN to a session in a, a UK region than it was to put it, just leave it in the US and pay the additional cost. Because there was no services being run in the US, they were just putting the desktop there so that when they could start menu it was responsive rather than being a bit laggy. Because the first thing you do right, when something's not working is you keep on clicking and then all of a sudden it goes and then you don't know what's going on. <laughs> so that's the kind of scenario that most people do is like, as an end user you start looking around for no reason whatsoever. That's a, a very high level example of a, a, a deployment we, that I've done from a, a Citrix on Azure scenario. So thinking around express route connectivity, Citrix Cloud providing the evergreen service into that platform, doing an enterprise Citrix Cloud model, so if it goes down, I can use level host cache functionality to run offline, because if Citrix Cloud goes down, they don't want to go down because they don't offer an SLA. Um, and then I've got a gateway service provider to secure access in, and then I have my session workers running in secure, uh, secure groups. So nothing can communicate out of anywhere unless we've authorized it to do so. so we put it in audit mode initially and then locked it down. Um, the idea on this was that every division in their organization had a different NSG for their workers they were going to be consuming, just to make sure that everything was as secure as possible from day one. It was a bit of a pain in the backside of the modest to get up and running, but once it was there, it was perfect. And they've got now 2,000 concurrent users running on Azure with Citrix. Um, would I want to do that today with WVD in their circumstance? But probably not from a management perspective, and probably not from a performance perspective, we'll see a bit later on. But guess what? Microsoft's co competition is like, great, we've just sold a load of resource for Microsoft by putting Citrix on it. So it's a win-win for them. They're still buying Microsoft licensing, or not in some cases, and they're still getting a job consumption. So everyone's a winner. If you think about um, smaller customers, so that's where like WVD I've seen quite a bit more of an uptake for recently. These people that want to provide a managed desktop service to a customer that's like maybe 50 users or something. There's been lots of POCs on that. And Citrix have come out with a Citrix managed desktop, which is the same scenario as WVD, whereby they manage 
even the, the um, session workers that people connect to, which has got the applications inside them, they provide everything. They actually do the billing back to Microsoft, and you just pay your citrus fee. So it's like one bill to pay for that. And then you do a VNet peer between your citrus managed environment and your own environment. So you've got the throughput between them. VMware, um, VDL and Azure, yes, they can do it with Horizon Cloud Service. Yeah, that's great. Um, WVD on Azure, at VMworld they were talking about them being able to do it. They still can't do it. I'm a bit unsure when it's going to be coming. Um, and I don't know what the uptake would actually be if they did bring it, if I'm completely honest. Um, no one's really done a lot with VMware running on a native Microsoft platform because Horizon is predominantly vSphere integrated. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that pans out. The, the main thing for me for VMware though is that they're, they're plugging into more the, the physical endpoint management play for Microsoft. And they're focusing on the new endpoint configuration manager, which is the Intune SCCM emergence that's going on at the moment. They're going to provide an overlay for that with AirWatch. Um, they're kind of losing a bit of focus on the WVD side because they're probably sat there thinking it's going to be a massive sale point for them, probably not. So a couple of videos here. So this is a WVD session running on DS4 V3 machines, so four vCPU systems for memory. Um, I filmed this from me earlier because my demo lab got destroyed by frame, which I'll explain in a moment. And you'll see that the performance is not that great, right? So that's WVD natively on a four vCPU machine trying to play a 1080p video from Azure. Probably not that great, right? And Ladies and gentlemen. Move on from that. Um, it's probably not an experience you users would want, and it's probably not an experience that you'd want to give someone either. Um, if you were just doing gener general like office work, like Office, Excel, like Word, Excel, Outlook, and a bit of web browsing for static content, then it probably works really, really well. As soon as you start pushing any kind of intensive graphical workload down it over a specific connection that may not be that performing, it just starts to fail very quickly. Bear in mind that was from here, from the Wi-Fi <coughs> provider in building, which I believe is three years of now, <laughs> which is pretty good. And that's the kind of performance we were getting. And there was no one, there was like maybe five people here, so it wasn't like a packed room. So I, I'm kind of like, I didn't get all the diagnostic data to say what the latency was and all that kind of stuff, but the performance wasn't great, right? If I then look at Frame, so Frame is a VDI system that Nutanix offers. Um, and they are a cloud native company. They were bought by Nutanix to help them deliver a VDI solution. Um, it's not a general purpose VDI offering in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's probably something that I would look at and say if you are a CAD CAM design company or you are, uh, do a lot of Revit and Autodesk, their product's perfect for you. If you're just a generic office worker that needs optimizations, they don't have that. If you need granular policy controls, they don't have that. It's not an enterprise grade VDI solution in any shape or form. But what it does do is this. It's the same video, running from frame. This is without optimization. There's no audio, because I didn't record with audio. And then I optimized it, which in their environment is just a dragon drop kind of scenario of all the sliders for frame rate and max network connectivity. And then I drop that back again. And then you'll see that it's a crisp 1080p viewing of this video in Azure on the same instance type, but with a different protocol overlay. But that's, that's pretty good, right? Does this compare with Teradici? Similar kind of thing, but it's, it's, it's H.265. Um, they've basically got their own protocol that leverages that at an intensive level. Uh, and they've got the OpenGL and all that kind of stuff for the GPU offload. That's not a GPU machine, because the UK South doesn't have any GPU machine available to them at the moment. Um, so that, that was just exactly the same, so I would just move a protocol chain. That's all it was. Works quite well. Um, again, not general purpose. Then I've got a video for Citrus Cloud. So I'm going to put this into perspective. Right? This video is 18 months old. Um, it's a DS2 V2 machine. So it's two vCPU, not four. And it's 7 gig, not 16. So it's half the machine size, basically. 
And to give you an idea, so my house in the middle of nowhere up north, where we have square wheels, not round ones, it connects over a two meg internet connection to the US. Then it connects from the US, from Citrus Cloud, back to a UK South Azure data center. And because it's SSL, guess what? It's going to go all the way back that way. Right? SSL handshake has to follow the way it came. And I've even shown you on this one the CPU utilization, which I'll tell you what the ones were in a moment. So that is using Citrus Cloud. From Pandora, a world of wonder. From 18 months ago, where that is the next next finish install again on a smaller machine. It's only using 50 odd percent of the CPU of a 2 vCPU machine to render that all in CPU. And it's pretty, pretty good. And that's going around the world. Right, so there's a lot of latency involved in that. The other solutions that I've shown you today, so Frame uses a lot of CPU, so that was hitting 90% of the full vCPU to deliver that 1080 video you saw before. And the WVD solution, as we saw earlier, was using about 80-85% to deliver the kind of suboptimal experience as it is today. So at the moment, if we say what is providing the best VDI or workspace solution in Azure, it's probably the one that's been leading for many, many years, unfortunately. Um, doesn't mean that everyone still needs this, though. Because in some circumstances, WVD may still be good enough, natively. What's the cost comparison, though? So the Azure hosting cost is exactly the same. Network cost probably drops down a bit. And you've actually got optimizations from Citrix that provide uh, web services. So you can do system optimizations where you can't consume 100% CPU for more than X number of seconds and then throttle it back by 10% on a process basis. That can help get more density. So it's kind of it depends scenario. Um, but you are paying a Citrix license. And if anyone has seen Citrix license before, it's not cheap. And I think the, the list price on the website per user per month is about $15. That's list price, right? So if you're a partner, you're going to get discounts on that, and it's you know, <laughs> and all that kind of thing, and there's deals to be had because of software vendor and Blue Moon scenarios. There's always a deal to be had. The thing for me is that I still go into a lot of organizations today, and if I'm completely honest, the whole virtual workspace kind of requirement has been declining for the last three years, four years. People are happy with a a laptop. Every business has got a laptop first because it provides business continuity, offline working, and they can control it with Intune and modern management with autopilot and an E5 license with AIP, ATP, and all these things that come from Microsoft, which gives you a great physical endpoint management solution, right? A few bugs, but it's, it's pretty decent, better than it's been before. So, what is the use case for WVD? It's those applications that are latency sensitive, which for me, in Every organization I go to, in that scenario where security is a requirement or latency is a requirement, um, we would provide that as a published application back to that endpoint onto the start menu if we can. So natively to the user, they log in to their autopilot into managed device, and then guess what? They've got a, an app there, they click and it launches a published session from a Windows 10 multi user session or a RDS session or a Citrix session, whatever, and pulls that back for that specific application, not for general general use. And that's what we've seen in the last like in the last 18 months, definitely. If a pick like healthcare though, and people in, in acute space where people are doing fast clinical switching and going around carts and wheels and all that kind of stuff, VDI is a very big selling point for them. Because they can go to any device in a hospital or in a community workspace and log on and get the session they had with all the patient data that they had previously and keep on top of it that way, not be logging in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times a day. So in that kind of fast switching environment, a WVD approach or some kind of virtual workspace is kind of a no-brainer in an acute space, definitely. Outside of that, I think it's just applications. How do you deliver that specific application you can't deliver with Intune or how do you deliver an application that's latency sensitive? So legacy latency sensitive back is going to be on premise. So putting it in WVD, you're adding a load of latency. Yeah, there's, there's also that. There's also like poorly developed applications, right, as well. So where they've natively built it in Azure, <coughs> but they've created a really crap .NET application that connects to it, and it needs to be running at like sub 10 millisecond latency. That still exists, right? We still have developers that do that stuff, unfortunately. Um, so, from an approach perspective, don't start with technology, generally speaking, square peg, round hole. 
capture the various requirements that you need to make a business <coughs> or make a change, and then you can map whether WVD is the right fit or not. Because I feel like the receptionist and I mentioned before, WVD could be perfectly good enough. Especially over an express route with a line connection, it would be good enough with the right size machine. The other thing that we ask is why are you doing this in the first place and what are you actually trying to achieve every time. So I'm an architect, right? I don't necessarily get involved in a lot of hands-on work anymore. I write high-level designs and low-level designs on how to deliver a solution that meets business requirements. That's, that's my job. So the thing that I'm always asking is why and what are you trying to achieve? Because if you're not asking those questions, then you're just putting technology in for technology's sake, not to actually fix any business challenge. But well, the engagement approach that everything you do, whether it's WVD or Citrix environment, or VMware environment, any kind of virtual workspace, you have to do an assessment. You have to. It's not, it's not oh, maybe, you have to. Because if you don't, you're going to not size it properly, it's not going to perform, the cost that you work out from the TCOR I expect it doesn't stack up, and then before you know it, your name's mud because it's cost me three times the amount we should do. And using things like this is Lakeside SysTrack, there is other products out there like Liquid Stratosphere. But the thing for me is that this is the one I've personally set up. Because I like this product personally. And the thing for me is I can see, if we put this onto WVD as an example, I can monitor whether the user experience is being positively or negatively impacted by the services available to that session. Is it an application latency? Is it WVD latency? Is it um, the user has tried to install something they shouldn't? What, how many hours a week are they losing from their productivity time due to an IT service related issue? And this is what your product tracks. And it allows to see software utilization, concurrency, and when we think about cloud, we'll see in the pricing calculator, it asks you how many concurrent users you're going to have on WVD, and how many hours a month is that going to be active, and what's the percentage split of in hours and out of hours, and all that kind of stuff. And you need that information, which is right there on the bottom right hand side of the screen. You get that figure, you put it in, you've got a more accurately priced solution than you would do by just going, Generally speaking, from a VDI point of view, or an RDSH or a Zen app kind of virtual access solution, if you're having a VM on for 14 hours or more a day, a reserved instance is an operator. Anything less than 14 hours is on the cusp of saying, pay as your guild might be good enough as long as you're turning it off. Right? And that's where that data allows you to optimise those costs in Azure to get you the right output. Productivity impact I mentioned before, how many hours a week is an endpoint or a person being impacted by a service? Gives you that, nice red, amber, green. i uh, give you an idea, I went and did a, a, an assessment with a healthcare trust and um, we actually accounted for 1,200 FTEs of lost time <coughs> because of log on times alone based on one log on a day. And nurses generally log on 20 times a day. And if you put that into a, into a figure of like national minimum wage as an example, it was like 40 odd million. It was ridiculous. A, a potential lost time. You can't accrue it to a figure really because it's they're doing something in that time. But it's lost productivity. Right sizing within environment, CPU memory, disk, network utilization, network being quite key on there. So the application back end talking to somewhere. And then we can also do that profiling thing. So we'll talk about power users, task users, light users, medium users, all that kind of stuff. You can put the parameters into this product, and then it will put those users into those buckets for you. So if you think that a light user for you is the same as what a light user is for Microsoft's definition, plumb that data in, it'll put users in that bucket, and it'll tell you how many users will fit that profile type. And you can type that in to calculate it to be a It makes it a lot more cost effective. Application utilization, what's used, what's not used. More importantly, what's actively at the front of the screen. So we can actually see what people are actually engaging with versus background tasks and all that kind of stuff that are happening. So we can make the support lifecycle and the environment a lot easier. The other thing from a support perspective for this product specifically is it tells you where the latency is from a process perspective. <coughs> so that big green box could be my Windows 10 session on Azure. That one there could, in the second from the right, the blue box could be output.exe. And the bottom end here would tell me the latency talking to Exchange Online. So if I had an online mode, I could see the latency and I could make changes, do cache mode. I could maybe, if it was an in-house application running on Azure, I could see what was going on to cause that latency. Is it a back-end issue with CPU memory and disk for that service? So it allows us to kind of 
find the fault. It might not actually be WVD that's a problem. It could be something else somewhere in the environment. That's just one example of problems. There's other problems out there. Liquid waste traps may be another one. Um, they're just providing you with more insight. And we don't get that with native UV today. And you only get some of that with Citrix and VMware, but not at that same level. Whenever looking at making a change, these are the key areas we think about. The capability of you, as individuals, to manage this moving forward. Why do you keep doing that? Um, capability of you as an individual, the technical capability within the team to deliver it. I don't like Microsoft. <laughs> so, the cultural changes you're going to make in an organization, the financial impact it's going to have, and then the innovation cadence. So how do you keep on top of Windows 10 every six months, every 18 months, every 30 months? How are you going to do that in the environment? And that's not just Microsoft products, but all the other as a service products you're consuming. How do they relate onto that? I'm going to hang up in a minute. One thing that I advise people to do is to think about their, your current environment. And these are just some areas you might want to think about. So the social, the identity. Sorry, guys, that's going to get stopped in a minute. Mm -hmm. Map out what you've got today, ultimately, and then see whether you can deliver some of this stuff with WVD. So Unified Comms being a kind of prime example, they're running it via soft phone system, and it ain't going to work on WVD. So are you happy using physical phones, as an example, rather than soft phone phones? That could be what an end state may look like if you were a Microsoft customer running E5. Because that is a Microsoft through and through. And if you think about the application delivery, Citrix, VMware, WVD would deliver that kind of legacy app. But then also you've got things like CloudHouse and Droplet because remote app, not remote app, app V's going in their life. So we've got MSI X coming and app attach and all those kind of things to help with that stuff. Um, but it's still a bit unclear on how we're going to do isolation services. <coughs> So these vendors specifically do application isolation and containerization. So how do you get a Windows XP application running on Windows 10 without breaking your security? Board? That's what they provide. Challenges generally in going to any of these environments is lack of factual information up front. Thinking the existing devices will work. Sorry guys, I'm going to have to catch yeah. up. Lack of factual information existing on these devices, and, and whether actually you connect into WVD or even Citrix or whatever it might be, how do we map those out? The user workflow, so would a virtual solution even work for them? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Um, from a physical endpoint perspective, modern management is the only way. It's something that people have jumped onto because they've got the E3 and E5 licensing from M365, so they want to manage it in the best way Microsoft advises you to do it. Some of the functions are not there yet. So it might not be the best way to go right now for some organizations. Innovation came plan and the technical capability of the product and of your team or your partners to deliver it. So Windows 10 sizing on Azure. Windows 10 over the last three years has grown in CPU, memory, and disk and network, as you see, by 30% in total the last three years. So when you're sizing your instances in Azure, if I'm going to put my neck on the line, I need to factor in three years worth of potential CPU growth. I need to add on another 30%. And that's done by a team from GoEUC, it's a community group, they've done this testing to see what the changes of from 1709 to 1903 is the latest test they've done there, and you can see that growth of change of CPU memory and disk. As well as the host read and writes, massively gone up on the latest, well, 1903, the storage requirement from the base image perspective have gone up. So if we've got physical endpoints with like, terabyte, like 256 gig storage, 512 or something, a terabyte SSD, it doesn't matter. But if you've got an Azure environment where you've only put 64 gig disk against it or something, you're going to have to change it and then change your model. And then before you know it, you might be at 512 gig and you're reserving the instance. Um, probably wouldn't be the most cost effective route at that point. So Windows 10 multi-user being the innovation change, um, one of the common questions that we see is, what is it? It is Windows 10 that allows you to have multiple users connect to it. It's simple, right? Um, how many users can you get on it? Well, it depends. 
what apps you've got on there, what CPU and memory and disk you're applying to that VM. If you can work out that, then you can get 100 users on there, or you can get three. You don't know, unless you get the right assessment data. Um, strangely, it actually reports as a server. So Windows 10 multi-user, if you look at it within Azure, it has a category of three. And the three category in the registry is a server ID. So one of the things that people think is that by using Windows 10 multi-user, I can install my Windows 10 apps because they're supported for Windows 10. Wrong. Because if they've got a check during install, a server OS, guess what they're checking for? That client number. Client number three does not allow Windows 10 applications to be installed on a server OS. It's not working again. I think that's going to change fairly soon. Right? It has to. Um, can it run on premises? No, not today. So you're only. Why would you do this over RDS? App Store, maybe? Edge, before it became Chromium based? Maybe you want to manage it with Intune and put all the AIP and ATP policies on there? Today it's not supported to manage WVD with Intune, just to let you know. It should be good to be. Do you think you know about RDS then? Well, actually, yes, because you're getting your VDA license as part of your M365 license. But most organizations have probably have them built into the VDA agreement already, so it's kind of a nominal cost saving at some point. And actually, depending on how their EA's been set up, it might not actually be any cheaper. Um, how do I customize an image? Because we all want to put our own apps in there. You get the image off the marketplace. It's got the optimizations in for BVD. You install your apps. Power it off and you import it in. So it is a step process we'll come on to later to do to generalize it, but that's the simple process of doing it. Um, how do you manage it? PowerShell or a UI uh, or a third party product. My advice there would be you can afford it and you want to do more WVD, get a third party product to manage it and monitor it until Microsoft bring out their version of it in the hopefully near future. Um, can I use Azure AD? as the only authentication mechanism for WVD? No. It needs a traditional domain controller. So it's Azure AD, uh, connect, replicated attributes, all that kind of stuff. It needs all that in place. It, it can't be just Azure AD native. And do you go for the 0309 release for Windows 10? You have a choice, 18 months of support versus 30 months of support. It's completely up to you which one you choose. When you go into the marketplace to get the image, you choose that version, spring release or the autumn release, you got the choice. Once you've done that though, you're on that release cycle and you keep on top of it. Otherwise it'll do it for you. And that's not a good place to be in, especially if you're running a non-persistent environment. So if you think you forget to do your update, for argument's sake, it's going to force that update in 18 months time whether you like it or not, because you haven't done it. And if it's non-persistent, it's going to keep powering off and powering on and powering off and powering on, because it can't write that back to the image because it's a non-persistent machine. So if you don't manage that cycle properly, you're going to get stuck in a loop, and then you're going to have no sessions, no one logging in, and a bit of an issue. If you do persistent machines, it's not a problem with this update and get on with it. So commercial. <coughs> How expensive or cheap is WVD? Choose your region, as always. Type pooled or personal. Pooled being non-persistent, personal being static machines. Number of named users. So 500 in this state. Peak concurrency, <coughs> 90%. Off-peak concurrency, not a lot. And then we're saying at the moment 220 hours of usage a month. We choose whether it's going to be multi-session or single session. So for most of your users that are like people who would be on a a Zen app environment, an RDS environment, multi use session will be perfectly fine. Any power user should go on a single session, really. Choose your workload type light, medium, heavy, and power, and it tells you what they relate that to there. Choose how many of those you've got, and then tell it the size of the machine you want to put that against. So, my advice is a minimum, especially if you're doing a standalone machine, that should be a Four vCPU, 16 gig machine minimum. Especially if you're running a full desktop experience, because that's what I was showing you before with 
not the best video content playback. If I actually shut that up to an 8 CPU machine and the CPU isn't bottoming out all the time, it probably would have run a little bit better. But then you're increasing more cost just to watch a video on YouTube. From a multi-user perspective, you've got to be mindful that in this scenario you're assigning a number of users against the vCPU. So, what I advise you do here is look at the version of machine that you're looking at in here, see what the clock speed of that machine is, or that host within Azure is, times that by the number of vCPUs you've got, divide that by the amount of megahertz or gigahertz per user session you're going to give your users, and that will tell you how many users per machine you're going to get. Not light and all that kind of stuff. That's the more accurate way of sizing it. Um, if you do it based on that, you're probably going to be guessing a little bit, but if you use that bucket scenario I mentioned before in something like Lakeside, just pumping that data it's giving you, and you can get some five. Page you go. I reckon I need 57 instances at 220 and 4 instances at 510 to make my concurrency levels, right? So the power management for me. With premium SSD, do not put anything other than premium SSD, because VDI workloads or user workloads are very disintensive. And the smallest one you can get in the 28 57 discs, it matches the number of instances we've got there. And you've got £6,000 per month that you add in that one. The support cost and whatever else at the bottom, if you add that, it's like £6,055 a month, 500 users. That's your license, that's your hosting, based on the parameters that we're putting on. That does not calculate your network connectivity. You still need to add that on top. As well as your profile storage and the ancillary instances you might need to provide file services and various other line of business applications and things you might need. You still need to add that on. Would you say Expressor is a must for this? 100%. Yeah. If you're running WVD to a, an office where you're going to have the majority of them on WVD, I would 100% say Expressor. Uh, or especially local maybe, or something along those lines would be more than good enough. Looking at the likes of a VPN gateway, if it was five, six, seven, ten users as like a remote drum box for admin, that would be good enough. Or well, hundreds of users connecting over it, I'd express them all day long. Um, doesn't fix your one issue, you know, you have lots of remote users. Um, you've got a factory in your internet breakout within Azure and the cost that going on with that as well. Um, if I change this though, to say that my users are the heaviest that they are, and I'm not doing multi-session because everyone needs a really powerful machine each, and they're all going to have 8 BCP and 30 gig memory, which is poorly unlikely, that's a good one. It's now 27 grand But that's because I have 450 VM to provide that service, right? Well, more than that, actually. But then the other thing is, if you reserve instance it, you make some savings. If I move back to my multi-session <laughs> approach, on the power user, on the 8 BCP machine, which is 6 grand a month, Wrong there, that's my price. Pay as you go, £6,055. Because it's 220 hours of maximum usage a month. Reserve instance, it means it's on 24 7. 7 grand. More expensive to reserve it. If your concurrency and utilization is that high. So play with those figures, I'll give you an idea of where you need to be. Also bear in mind, if you're doing um, multi-user sessions, that disk only provides you 500 IOPS. So if you've got 10 users on that one box, 50 IOPS each, is that enough? Maybe. Check the application. This is, as we said earlier, it has to be, you have to have a qualifying M365 license or a Windows 10 subscription. Yeah, or an RDS Cal or yeah. all those kind of things. Um, the next thing on the break, you know what's comfort break? Yeah, quick two minute break, grab a drink, grab a bit Okay. So, part 
two is, is <coughs> a little bit more deep yeah. into WPD specifically. Um, we're going to fly through some of the slides because uh, it is the masterclass slide deck on WBD. Um, but ultimately, so the user connection flow is quite a key understanding to, to have as part of the platform. So one user launches the RD client on the HTML5 <coughs> client and connects into the environment. The RD client presents the token for web access. It gets the broker in service and it talks about the have access to, authenticates them, and then it provides them access to the resource that they have access to. Then they can select that access, there's no auto like connect mechanism in there. And then you get brokered into your session. Now it flows directly between the RD client and the session host. It doesn't have to go via all that stuff, even with the SSL handshake in place because it can palm that off. The reason it does that is because of the reverse connect functionality built into the problem. So the broker becomes the gateway, strangely, and it keeps it as all 443 to the back end. So it's actually quite efficient on the way that it does it. Um, the, the challenge ultimately is, is, is how does it scale when we get to tens of thousands of users? Which we're never really going to find out in the near future, I don't think, in the public domain space anyway. And the good thing is, is no inbound ports needs to be opened for a VM. You know, it's just going to be 443 everything that comes out of it, to the broker at least. Anyway. Object models. Um, it's worth understanding what the external world see as the name and convention and what Microsoft see as the name and convention in the back end. Subscriptions and tenants, tenant, pressing forward. Resource groups and Windows images, the kind of things we're used to knowing about Azure. Host pools in WVD. Uh, a VM, well that's quite self-explanatory. Uh, session host. That could be um, a, a, a RDS session host, it could be a Windows 10 multi-user, it doesn't matter, it's clusters and session host. Subset of apps and image is an app group. And that is basically just a config of what you can have access to. It could even be, in the near future, a MSI X attach dynamic group. Sign in user, use a user session, publish Windows application, remote app, publish Windows desktop, remote desktop. Pretty straightforward, right? So whenever you see that kind of stuff related back to what Azure promotes it as into the blades and things, because that's what you're going to relate it to it when you're speaking to people generally, that stuff you're only going to ever see go for the GUI, um, which I wouldn't advise right now. Prerequisites for getting WBD installed, a subscription, kind of an no uh, Azure Active Directory, an on-premise Active Directory of some sort, all associated Azure resources, so making sure you've found your images you want to use, your network's in place, any um, additional security um, policies, maybe just letting the lock policies and all that kind of stuff in place in yeah, the environment, and then any credentials that you need for your tenant, your service, your service principles, all that kind of stuff needs capturing up front. And there's a good checklist if you, if you basically search WBD checklist, tells you where to get all that information from and what PowerShell commands to run to get that information so that you can put it into your Excel document and keep a note of it so that when you build this, it's, it's simple. And if you don't capture all that information, you'll get very confused, right? Because when you're doing, and you'll see in a moment, there's your marketplace, it'll ask for your domain name or your service principal name or whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the <coughs> domain name it's after. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the SPM and how you're going to write that SPM down. Or ask for an OU, do you put in DC equals OU equals all that kind of stuff, no, it doesn't need that either. So it's like, what does it actually want? The PowerShell commands that it tells you to run will give you that information. You can copy it. Um, identity, how are you going to manage that in the environment? You have options. Spin up a DC in your Azure subscription, that's the easiest one. If I'm honest, if you're used to doing on-premise domain controllers, that is the easiest one to configure and get working, and then link it back to your existing on-premise domain if you have that as well. Um, you can look at using Azure AD directory services. There's no real reason why not. It's just that everything else would probably be connecting to your own premise AD. And if you've not got replication sources in place, all that kind of stuff is kind of not going to work very well. And then hybrid, which is the way that we advise you to do it, is ultimately a VPN gateway to your on premise environment, Azure AD connect, replication, and work modes, that kind of thing. Or attributes for some of work modes. Requirements from a network perspective. Express route 100% for hybrid, 100% for anyone connecting from a large number of users from a site. Uh, when you need a guaranteed amount of latency and throughput into Azure, Express route will be able. Side to side VPN, small number of users, limited bandwidth. It's not actually limited bandwidth anymore. We were saying the other day you can now get like 25 gig or 20 gig. Yeah, you've got 20 gig, you can get with 5. Yeah, or you can go V1 and go 25 gig. It's up to you, really. 
Um, have you got a 20 gig file or have you got a 20 gig internet breaker? Probably not. not. Um, Azure AD domain services, again, since isolated, you use that. So you literally log into your Azure AD domain inside your POC terminal. So if you create it just for a bit of play, you could just do that. It's not going to integrate with anything else on premise. Um, creating a Windows Virtual Desktop tenant. So you grant your account access into your tenant for WVD. And it basically just asks you, do you want to give permission? If you don't have the right access to give permission, it'll give you a load of errors, and then it'll give you a PowerShell command to run at the bottom. <coughs> so you'll, see, you'll see like a common theme. You'll run that and I'll tell you why it failed, because the log that shows you on the screen doesn't it? give you a lot of information. Um, assign a tenant creator. So when you create a, um, a, 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 basically a rule in that says this is your user account, this is what you're going to use for your WVD authentication services, or you're going to allow it to create the pools and all that kind of stuff, you need that tenant creator. If it doesn't have access to do that, it won't work, it just fails. And the actual error message on failure isn't very useful, and that's the bit I mentioned going around, going around in circles, just deleting the environment and rebuilding it again. So there's some pretty good scripts out there in GitHub that actually knows every attribute that it builds in the process, and you can just copy it and just delete everything, so long as you give it the right variables of names that you've put in during the process. And then create your tenant within PowerShell. Um, VMs should be deployed in Azure region where there is WVD clusters available to it. Kind of given, right? If you're trying to deploy something that's not available, it's not going to deploy it anyway. Um, understand app and users to perform tenant host pool design. So what apps are located where? What is it going to be an RDSH box? Is it going to be a Windows 10 VM? Mapping all that application delivery mechanism out is quite key up front. Um, recommend a mix of breadth and depth scaling. So is it more users per VM or less users and lots of VMs? There's actually breakpoints on where it's more cost effective to go one way over another. And actually there's a risk versus reward scenario of having less users per VM means the quicker it can be turned off. Right? So if you have lots of users on this VM, the chances are there's always going to be one user connected. Which means you can't turn it off and you can't save any money. If you resist instances, it doesn't matter. It'll be on 24 7 anyway. Um, leverage multi-session is the recommendation from Microsoft only if you can size it accurately enough to warrant a user is going to get the right amount of resource for their, their role and task. If you don't know the workload size and you just want to play around this and give it to someone to test in your organization, as an example, give them a single session and then monitor the CPU and disk within uh, Visual Dashboard to see what's going on. Um, ideally, use a monitoring tool like Lakeside or Liquidware, but for now, they're fine. Um, VM configuration should match the use case host and pull needs for right sizing, as I mentioned before. That's, that's key for you, right? For costing and performance of what the user's going to get. So, marketplace provision. You go in, you do a search for virtual desktop. You say create. You put a load of information in. You tell it what kind of profile size you're using, which is the same model we mentioned earlier for the commercial element. The number of users you're having, the size of the machine, the prefix of name that you want for the VM what you want it to look like, ultimately. So if you go into uh, credential access policies, like a little tile, what do you want it to show, what icon, what color scheme, all that kind of stuff, what image version you're using, you're using the multi-session um, or 1903 release, 1909 release, whatever it might be, you're choosing those at this point, or you've got a custom image you can choose from there as well. Specify the domain or you, if you want to. If not, it's just gonna drop it into the computer's container. Probably not the best housekeeping thing to do. Virtual network, um, most demo environments you're going to configure, you probably just create one big VNet probably. Even as a lab, I still wouldn't do that. Um, and then review the subnet configuration as well. So maybe one big VNet with lots of subnets and then another VNet for something else. My advice is for anyone looking at doing a Citrix overlay of this, or definitely a frame overlay, um, have a separate subscription or at least a minimum of a resource group for it, because when you deploy frame as an example in its current form, it deletes everything inside the, sub in the resource group. Hence why my lab doesn't exist at the moment. Um, <laughs> so I was in Serbia last week for a beta program in Nutanix for, for frame, and they didn't tell me that would happen. So I jumped ahead in the, uh, in the session, and I probably shouldn't have, and then pressed go, and then it's basically uh, rather than doing a, a, an increment update, it's done a complete update, it just blips the entire environment, removed networks, removed NSGs, VMs, storage accounts, and built only what frame needs. It's not great. But do a lot of work here. 
if you're happy with it, and then it'll go away and build it for you, as so long as you've got all the right things in those boxes. If you hover over them, it gives you an idea of what it's looking for and the structure it's looking for. As I mentioned before, there's a checklist with a lot of power drill commands. Run them, run them in an Excel spreadsheet, copy and paste them into the boxes, you can't get it wrong then. Um, the biggest thing is if you don't have the domain services in place properly, it fails every time as well. It'll get to a point of deploying the machine, then when it tries to do a DNS lookup for the domain and can't find it, it just leaves the machine in a hung state and you can't do anything other than delete everything. Start again. Yeah, it's really important as well to make sure the Active Directory, <coughs> legacy Active Directory, heritage, whatever you want to call it, um, is syncing to the Azure Active Directory tenant that you're using. Yeah. You can't use a different Azure AD tenant to the one. So the Active Directory on prem has to sync to the same Azure AD tenant you use. You yeah. can't use a different Azure AD tenant because it won't match the user up. That's how I felt the first time. Yeah. So it has to be syncing to the same Azure AD tenant that you're using all the way through. Manual provision. So I'm going to skip through these very, there's like lots of these ones because there's lots of processes. But to give you an idea, download all the tools or customize your image ultimately. Make sure you've done a generalization on it. Go in, convert it to a template, follow that process, which goes on for a while. Create a host pool using the commands on that screen there. Create a temp host pool using the token that's defined. Input that information into the RDP file and then you can connect and, and play around with it. Then, you go then try and run into the domain, make sure all those services work. It's basically doing like a manual test of all the things that happen in the background normally. Put your token in, verify the session host member of the host pool. It goes on and on, you've got all these networking tasks to do. Manually activating the multi-user, because it's not done automatically for you. There's a PowerShell command to actually enable the multi-user session. If you download the multi-user session customized image, and then you update it, and then you run an out-of-box experience on it, it removes the registry key to <coughs> a multi-user session. So you need to redo that to get it back into being a multi-user VM. And that's pretty much it. There's a lot more steps there than just doing it in the GUI, because it's doing everything in the background for you. If I'm brutally honest with you, there is probably on excess of 30 PowerShell commands to run in the right order to get it to do it manually. Mm -hmm. And that's without going into the VM and generalizing it and stuff. Um, it gives you lots of red errors um, <laughs> and, and basically says, uh, this doesn't work, go away. I didn't recognize any of those PowerShell boxes that didn't have red script in it. No, no, it's just the other ones. It's giving you warnings, but the warnings don't mean anything either. So. Uh, load balancing. So, breadth first load balancing, depth first load balancing. So, it's basically saying, do I pump all the users onto one VM or do I do it over across a load of proportion of host inside a pool? You can configure that within the policies as well. So, it'll actually start assigning, for example, a, an app group to 20 VMs, and it'll say, right, I'm just going to shove the first 20 people on here, then the next 20 people on there, and all that kind of stuff. It is only looking at the dashboard information on CPU memory and disk utilization for doing that, right? doesn't necessarily mean the user experience in that session is acceptable. So it's a bit like the old days where you're saying 90% CPU once you're there, then moving on to another host. It's very basic on the way it's doing these load balancing of users. Auto scaling, it's a scheduled task. So it's going to look at the environment and auto scale things based on demand and concurrency and it's going to look at what the, the ideal route will be moving forward. It's going to use some of the services within uh, <coughs> analytics service, Windows analytics services would be my thought process on this. And it's going to capture that information, relay it back and then configure that for you hopefully doesn't do that today. You know, the manual kind of thing. You put an XML file in, you put the parameters in, and then it monitors it and then changes it if you need it to. Again, 90% then do X, 20% then do Y. Um, there's a GitHub repository for the scheduled task server. So you need that to the auto scaling. If you don't put that in there, then you're not going to get auto scaling, you're just going to have 500 VMs sat there. How long? There's an XML file. It's actually now a lot longer than that one. Um, but you don't actually need to do a lot of editing once you download it. It's like three attributes, I think it was on top of the line, you need to change. Planning and design. So we mentioned this light, medium, heavy, and power user. These are the kind of areas that, that Microsoft believe users would fit on. I agree, data entry, six users per vCPU with the right size machine, maybe. Um, my only worry there is that a call center, soft phone, definitely wouldn't work. 
250 meg per user seems quite low. Like one call center web app will probably consume that with Google or even a new Chromium browser. So I would probably say that is not a workload you'd be using today. I would probably be saying as a minimum you want to be going for the heavy worker for everybody. Because as soon as you open multiple tabs in these things, it's using 500 meg to a gig just for the web browser. Mm. And you've only got 650 there. So just for me, heavy work is the place to start. I'd ignore light and medium for now. Um, and they actually give you a better user experience. Application dependent. Um, option two is use Azure Migrate to tell you what sizes to use. Um, don't do that. It's not very good. Um, the recommendation is to design your network using hub-spoke topology. It's kind of the way you would do it anyway. Um, the other thing for me on this is if we start looking at like a project that me and Jack worked on, um, using an SD WAN product to do the hub-spoke element for us. So doing, um, if we take examples, it's SD WAN. It integrates with VWAN, so we get the BGP and throughput um, working from a, an Azure perspective. And then all the branch sites connect into control nodes from a Citrix perspective within Azure and broker the connection in over the 25 gig limitation on that. Now supports Express Route, which is a bit we're missing when we did our original design. Um, but that is one way of getting a, a customer that we had that only had between 5 and 50 users across initially 172 sites in the UK. Because um, they're like facilities management people, cleaners, and only there for short periods of time. They have no connection today. They were, they were buying services off the people that were renting the building off them, strangely. Um, and they were getting overcharged for it. They had no insight, and okay, no way of providing good user experience, and all that kind of stuff. So they've now got their own network connection using 4G and a, a business broadband connection into the SD1 products into Azure with failovers into multiple reason and all that kind of stuff. So it works quite well. Um, very cost effective for small users across lots of sites because you wouldn't want to put an express route into every region or every single branch site it would cost you a fortune. Identity access management, um, because it's relying on traditional uh, domain services, build a good OU structure. Um, don't just put a WVDO, you just dump everything in there. Create it like you would do normally, security groups, the um, worker sessions, any infrastructure nodes you've got applying to those. Just tag everything, descriptions, the entire lot. Don't just single on you in and hope for the best. Okay. Management. Um, you can actually manage your master image by any management tool you're already managing images today. So that could just be as simple as MDT. Um, it could be using the new um, lifecycle services built into Azure DevOps to manage that stuff for you as well. It could be a mixture of Chef and Puppet integrated with a Terraform script of some sort. It could be any of those platforms. It could just be SCCM. Doesn't matter. You can still manage a Windows 10 image like you do today, even if it's in Azure. Um, there's an element around updating in place versus redeploying your session hosts. So if you're doing non-persistent, it would be a redeploy. If you're doing persistent machines, then um, I would probably advise just doing a cleanse and rebuild every three months as a minimum. Um, and that way you're going to get a clean environment if you're not doing more persistent for everybody. It keeps everything nice and neat. Uh, application masking from um, FS Logics as part of the solution will allow you to install more applications into the image than a user may actually need, then hide it from them based on rules within FS Logics. So think of that scenario where everyone wants this one gold image with every app installed, but licensing wouldn't allow you because you'd get a fine or whatever it might be. FS Logics hides that application for you, stops you getting access to it, and allows you to have that single, as close to single gold image as you can. So you can almost get there. Patch management. It's kind of simple stuff. I've been doing this for ages. Have a dev pool, have a pilot pool, have a production pool. Roll it through the UAT process as you've always done. Um, I'm hoping in the near future, for anyone doing persistent uh, VMs with uh, WVD, that you can manage them within you like you would do a physical endpoint. Because then you could use the same configuration policies and deployment profiles within Intune to do what you're doing within WVD. That would make more sense. Today it's only uh, SCCM natively integrated into WVD. Guess the less you do whatever you want, but to actually do everything from the ground, it's SCCM. 
it's not far away. Um, Azure AD login for Azure VMs is in preview now. So as soon as that goes GA, I'd imagine that all of these features will just be Last image config. So if you've downloaded the image from the marketplace, install FS Logic Agent if it's not one that has the FS Logic Agent already installed, because there is like acronyms at the end of every single one that tells you what's pre-installed and what isn't. Um, deploy OneDrive per machine, don't do the per user install because it doesn't work in, a, in a, an environment, especially if it's a multi-user environment, it will just, it just doesn't install for a starter. But if you manage to hack away and get it to install, like some people I know have done, it then just starts to download terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data from OneDrive. Uh, and the reason for that is because a per user one is, is in the per user profile and it's not files on demand, it's files all the time based on the configuration policy that's been assigned by the IT organisation. Whereas the, the per machine one is more files on demand, so you can see your files, you click it, then it will download it, rather than it downloading an entire directory from OneDrive for offline sake. Apply recommended registry keys, there's a ton of advisory registry keys around jumbo frames and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, there's a product called BizF, it's free in the community. Um, BizF is predominantly used in Citrix environments, but what it is really good at is optimizing Windows OS and applications. So you basically just run a script that tells you what it's done, and it keeps up to date, checks your antivirus policies, if you've got anyone in there, all that kind of stuff, like cleansing of your image before you put it live. Um, if you're not using it on any on-premise environment today, I would just use it, it simplifies that sealing process for gold images. Sys at the end, and then it's ready for putting into the beauty tool. Deploying the new uh, to update your image, sip prep it, note your source, the HD file, use as a custom image, you have to convert it to be a custom image and then deploy it to your system as well. Third party management. There's only one third party management in here because it's the only one I've actually had time to play with. Um, so there's a company called Flexible IT um, and they have a management dashboard that's hosted in Azure as well. It provides you the monitoring capability of your instances. So it's like the late cycle I showed earlier, but not as intense on monitoring. It's more about management. But you can actually see the application usage and how you're going to deploy those machines, and it can actually start to instruct WVD to spin up more machines for you. So when we have the task scheduler via instance we mentioned before, this can do that for you as well from an API perspective. Um, not much data in there in my environment because it's only been installed recently. The idea is you can actually push out and build the environment for you rather than doing it in the Azure marketplace. So when you point it to your subscription, you say, right, I want a WVD tenant on the top left. It then asks you for all the parameters that it would ask you in the other environment with more information and more error alerting if it goes wrong. You press go and it'll go away and build everything and it doesn't delete what's in your existing resource group. That's tested. Um, user profile, bear in mind that is a paid for product. Um, I don't know how much it costs. <laughs> and again, it's only been something I've been looking at recently based on the base of customers asking for WVD, but the management being poor. So I don't know how much it costs yet, and I'm still using it in a bit of anger to see if it's any, any good or not. So far, it seems, seems pretty good. User profiles. FS Logics provides profile containers, app masking, and job redirections we mentioned earlier. Profile containers is basically a VHD file that holds your entire profile. The idea behind it is it's as fast to mount a 500 meg profile as it is a 5 gig profile with FS Logics. And I'll give you an example. So you can actually mix FS Logics with existing environment management products like Avanti Environment Manager or what used to be AppSense, or with Workspace Environment Manager from Citrix or UEM from VMware. You can integrate FS Logics with those, and I've got customers that got their logon times in their VDI environment less than 10 seconds consistently. Which is pretty good, right? Because everyone says less than 30 seconds is good, but if you get less than 10 seconds, it's even better for first level. Um, app masking, I mentioned before, is hiding applications from people. And it also does reporting, so the 90 day rule for Microsoft, um, where you can't move the licenses from someone within 90 days and it's assigned to a user, it tracks that as well. So you may have Snow Inventory Client and other things doing that, but it provides it as part of the product that you've got with FS Logics. It's not replacement for Snow or equivalent products, but it gives you a bit more information you've got nothing. Job redirection before is a sysadmin saving grace. It's the most unsung part of FS Logics that I've actually heard. It's like no one ever uses it, no one knows about it, and then they complain about Java and then they configure two rules. It basically says talk this one to that one and it fixes the problem and you get more on an image. It's great. So 
I'll skip through most of these, we've done a talk them anyway, but fast logons for the profile element. Office 365 containers is if you want to use your existing profile solution, whatever that might be, and you just want it to cache the Office 365 elements, like the OST file, the indexing services, the index files and that kind of stuff. The idea is with FS Logics that if you have a non-persistent environment, you're jumping between VMs every time you log on, that index file follows you as well. And it also stops corruptions for OST and profiles as well, so you can actually have multiple people accessing the same OST file, which is quite good. So if you've got like, shared mailboxes and things like that, and you're caching them locally, you cache it to one directory, and have concurrent access to that one file. So there's a uh, Wilkie, who's one of the Citrix CTPs. There's a, um, a little, little blog post that he's done that tells you all the tip boxes and things that you can do in the concurrent access to various cache files that he creates as well. So I wouldn't say it's wild, widely used today, but it's something they can offer to make shared mailboxes and other things more performant in a non-persistent environment way, so that's how I all those files all the time. That masking is already covered. And Java direction pretty much covered as well. Get NFS logics installed if you haven't done it, or it's not got the image that you've already got it installed on, you've not done it in your existing environments, for example, on premise. It's an agent, next next finish agent inside your image. It's a file share directory somewhere. It's an AGMX group policy and some rules if you want to do that masking. That's it. So other than a file, like a UNC path ultimately, and a group policy object and an agent install, that's it. There's no massive infrastructure, no SQL databases or anything like that. <coughs> what that means though is you need a pretty resilient file services solution to provide your profiles. So if you've got people connected from multiple regions, how do you make sure that profile is available in all regions potentially. That's where, if we ignore this slide for a second, things like Panjora and Zuni, those global file system solutions would be very useful. DFS is not advised for profiles from a DFSR perspective. It doesn't do a very good read-write kind of response that's not actually supported by Microsoft. Um, if you're using Zuni or Panjora, then it's pretty much near line sync, so you're basically going to be fine in that kind of scenario. Um, if we look at a single region or a single tenant environment, you have option of using Azure files natively or Azure NetApp files. The idea here is that if you're using Azure files, you're going to lose NTFS permissions. Because Azure files today doesn't do NTFS. Azure NetApp files does. And you can still take advantage of the backend storage that's on offer from Microsoft to get the more cost effective route. For me, it is a cloud only option with Azure NetApp files. It's LRS equivalent, it's not got like GRS or ZRS today. There's a little bit more of a cost involved in it because you've got the license from NetApp to pay for ultimately as part of the service. Um, but as a rounded solution, it's probably a lot more resilient, a lot more feature rich, and allows you to do um, the NTFS elements that you don't generally have with Azure files today. I believe that NTFS with Azure files is coming. Um, I don't know when, I don't know you know. It's yeah. in preview, but you have to have Azure apps stretched to my services at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so it's not available in the near future. Six months. Six months. Yeah. So the idea. Yeah. The other thing is you get more options of storage underneath the NetApp platform than you do on the Azure files element as well. So you can use more performant storage or less performant storage depending on what you're trying to deliver. We've already kind of covered size and guidelines, but so single session VMs, four V CPU, six gig of memory. Well, the closest machine you can get to on Azure is the minimum for a single session machine. Um, for multi-user, I'd probably go with 8 vCPU and 32 gig as a starting point. Whether that's RDS or Windows 10 multi-user. Um, and then scale it based on your application demand. App delivery. So app v, end of life. Um, there's no real replacement for app v as such yet. Um, there's more isolation capability supposedly going to be made available in the whole MSI app attach. So if anyone that doesn't understand MSI app attach, it's basically a VHD file that merges on demand as part of your file. So it makes you think that it's um, locally installed inside your OS, but it's not. It's a, it's a mount directory ultimately for whatever you push down to the endpoint or to the virtual machine. So you can have multiple VHD files providing different applications. The bit that's unclear at the moment is whether that each of those VHD files because we've got FS Logics that does the right filter and refilter management, whether it will do isolation at that level. Because if it does, we can get an app free equivalent almost from a right filter and refilter perspective. I'm still waiting for some of that stuff to come. Um, 
equivalent to MSI, MSIX Appetach is at volumes and at layering from the MMO Citrix. Do not use those two products. They are god awful. And there's no actual requirement for them in most of those environments because you've got better single image management processes in place with machine creation services and instant clones and all that kind of stuff. Um, log on times of that volumes will increase by 30 to 60 seconds when you have more than three app volume or app stacks attached. So it's kind of a, not a very good idea to do that. You want good log ons. And app layering, if you can get it to work, let me know because um, every CTP and CTA is advising people that it's not a product to use. It's slow, it's sluggish, it's a pain in the backside to manage, there's additional management servers needed to manage the app layering product itself, it doesn't make any sense. The time you're saving on your application management is probably taking up in managing that infrastructure for that product. It's kind of pointless. Um, app containers, so I mentioned before that like Cloud House um, and Droplet. So Droplet's fairly new. So Droplet's like, I don't know, does anyone know Peter Von Oven? used to be a uh, staff architect at uh, VMware, so he started his own business and created a product that's based on delivering a containerized um, application within a, chrome, a managed Chromium application. So they've got a Chromium browser inside their application, you can install, it's been signed off by NCC for um, cyber security and pen testing and hacking and that to make sure it's secure, and you can run a Windows XP application in there on any device. Uh, whether it's Linux, Mac, and Windows based. So you can get your XP applications into Windows 10. It also means if you're like a bank and you've got a really old OS2 application somewhere that has to run at a certain speed, then you can actually dial back that container to the speed that that application was written for, which makes it more performant than actually trying to run it at a higher gig. So you get a bit more control on that stuff as well. And it's dirt cheap, because it's new, and there's not many case references for it at the moment. Uh, but it does work. Uh, Cloudhouse, those have been around a while, and they charge you a fortune because their product does very similar to what um, Droplet can do, but not for um, every application out in the market. And they, because they are classed as legacy application solving, and as soon as you put legacy in front of anything, it means they can charge you 10x the cost of what it actually is to fix because if you don't, you're stuck on an unsupported version of Windows or whatever it might be. Um, think of Cloudhouse as a App V equivalent, but with m more containerization security built in than that we have. And it doesn't run in the life. It kind of helps as well. And then the other one then is image install. It's all in your image and app mask it. That's logic. That's probably what most people do. It's the easiest way. Install the apps in it to interoperate together. Install it to one image and manage that one image. And then use rules to block things. As soon as you start adding these other things on, it gets quite complicated. It's probably easier to have multiple images. Monitoring, so I mentioned Lakeside earlier. Um, it's the only one that I have a lot of knowledge about, which is why it's on here. Um, ultimately, they integrate directly into the WVD and Citrix managed services as well to provide all of that as a service to you from the cloud. So you can take it as Lakeside as a service. You get the agent, you put the agent inside your image, it talks back into Azure where they hold their service, and you get all the information I showed you before from the national dashboard from anywhere, and you can push it out because it's user license. You can push it out to your physical endpoint to get the same information from there, back out to the cloud as well. Um, extremely powerful product if used in the right way. And then that's pretty much it. Other than questions and anything else. I thought I'd rattle through that last bit because it has gone on for quite a while. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.